Bom dia, professor. E bom dia, Gavin. Como vai? Ó? É, muito bem. E yeah. o senhor? Yeah. Muito, muito bem. Também. I am here with uh, my engineering professor, one of my engineering professors. Yes, I'm Neil Grigg. I'm one of the professors here at Colorado State University. I had Gavin in one of my courses. Uh, we've exchanged a little Spanish and Portuguese over the years. And as a matter of fact, I think I just said today in Spanish rather than today in Portuguese. In any case, I, I do speak a little Portunol. Portunol, yeah. I was born in the state of Alabama, which is a lot like the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Alabama is a, is a state in the southern part of the United States, and we have what's called a southern accent. And you might think that the southern accent is just one accent, but it's not. It's a lot of different accents. Like the state of Louisiana is also in the south, and it has some French influence in it. So the southern accent, unless you're uh, really trained to pick out the differences in those different regions, it sounds like one accent, but it's not. But mine originally was Alabama, but then I've been gone from Alabama for 50 years, so it's been moderated a lot um, by different places that I've been. What specific city in Alabama? Montgomery is the name of the city. Okay. It's the capital of Alabama. Uh-huh. Do you, how many languages do you speak? I play around in maybe five or six. Ele vai usar várias vezes o phrasal verb to play around in. Desta vez quando falar de aprender línguas estrangeiras, que quer dizer que ele tem interesse e aprende um pouco de cada uma, mas não com muita profundidade. Do you, how many languages do you speak? I play around in maybe five or six. Uh, Spanish is my uh, strongest language. Portuguese at one time was stronger than Spanish. Uh, but I haven't worked in Brazil for a long time, so now my Portuguese is a lot weaker. But I also play around in German, French, and Italian. But I'm not fluent in any of them. I just play around in them. And when I was studying Spanish um, in school, I had a chance to go to Mexico way as far back as 1960, if you can imagine. And that sort of stimulated my interest in it. And then when I was in the military, I was in Europe, and you had all these different languages. So I just, and, and I was always impressed by interpreters, you know, as how they could interpret and, you know, they could facilitate meetings and all of those different things. And so I just took an interest in it and I studied those languages. And then one of the things that I found that really helps you in studying languages is to sort of stick with it. To stick with. Outro phrasal verb que quer dizer permanecer com, não abandonar. One of the things that I found that really helps you in studying languages is to sort of stick with it. You know, look for opportunities to read the media, talk to people, you know, watch television, listen to the radio. And I would always try to do that. And then over the years, when I had a chance to do something in a different country, I'd work a little on the language. Prestem atenção aqui durante o resto do vídeo, porque ele fala do passado usando muito o would, mas um infinitivo de um verbo, que é outra maneira de falar do que acontecia no passado, o passado imperfeito do inglês. Ele também fala aqui over the years, que quer dizer ao longo dos anos. And I would always try to do that, and then over the years, when I had a chance to do something in a different country, I'd work a little on the language. I even tried a little bit once in Arabic, and when I was in China once, I was going to learn a few characters, you know, but wow. <laughs> you can only do so much, you know, and so... Uh, you can only do so much, é uma expressão idiomática que quer dizer que você não consegue fazer tudo. É limitado o que pode influenciar ou aprender. When I was in China once, I was going to learn a few characters, you know, but wow. <laughs> you can only do so much, you know, and so uh, um, I've never had a chance to study Russian or, or Greek or some of those languages, you know, but languages are really fun. It's so cool to be the person in the room who can understand every conversation. You know, it's almost like a, you're a code breaker of some sort, and I really like that aspect, like you said, too. It gives you a tremendous advantage. You can, um, you can be mobile socially, you can talk to people, you know, you can help people talk to themselves. It's just tremendous advantages. I had a great opportunity to go to Brazil the first time, it was 1972, and I was invited to go down to um, give some classes in Porto Alegre at the University, Universidade Federal, Dodge Federal do, do Rio Grande do Sul. And they had there a center for applied hydrology that they were just developing under UNESCO, United Nations sponsorship. And they had funding to bring people in. So I was, I was lucky to be brought in down there. And I had an affinity for all of the people and we developed relationships. So uh, they kept inviting me and I went down somewhere between 15 and 20 times over a period of a few years. Okay, ele falou três coisas interessantes aqui. Affinity é afinidade em português e to have an affinity for someone or something 
quer dizer gostar de alguém, gostar de alguma coisa. Hoje em dia sou meio antigo, na verdade. Ele disse, they kept inviting me. To keep, mas o participio presente de um verbo quer dizer continuar fazendo algo. Finalmente, ele falou somewhere between, e aí uns números. Já ensinei more or less e give or take, que são maneiras de expressar mais ou menos, de aproximar um número em inglês. Somewhere between... É mais um. I had an affinity for all of the people and we developed relationships so uh, they kept inviting me and I went down somewhere between 15 and 20 times over a period of a few years. They even offered me a job to come down there and run that program but I couldn't do it. To run, literalmente correr, também pode significar gerir, tipo to run a business, gerir uma empresa, to run a program. Gerir um programa. They even offered me a job to come down there and run that program, but I couldn't do it. Uh, but at any rate, um, we we had this affinity with the um, with each other, and so I started, you know, developing my Portuguese, and I got to the point where I could practically give my lectures in Portuguese, and I could talk to people, professional people, uh, and uh, you know, for a long uh, time there was. Uh, just a great experience for me and we we visited of course Rio de Janeiro, Brasilia, um, went to um, Fortaleza later on a different subject up in Nordeste, mm -hmm. up there, the, the dry region of Brazil. Um, and then where else did I go? I went to... Uh... Ok, ele já falou do sotaque dele. Algo que acontece nesse sotaque é o som do... O R duplo do português, que acontece no sotaque dele antes de palavras em inglês que se escrevem com WH no começo. Aqui ele falou where, que eu ia pronunciar where, só. Outros exemplos, e vou tentar imitar. Which, what, why, white, wheat, whip. Um, and then where else did I go? I went to um, a couple of places in Rio Grande do Sul. Um, I went to um, Minas Gerais, I've been to Sao Paulo just briefly, a lot of different places, you know, like that. Never been to the Amazonas to see it, but we always were talking about the Amazonas and uh, Mato Grosso, you know, I've, I've got a map over there of all the states, so... Yeah, I you do, actually, I want to show that too. This is how, I think this is how we first started talking yeah. about Brazil, is because I saw this map in, uh, in Neil's office here, mm. and... Like, oh, how, how did you get this map in Portuguese of Brazil? So mostly mostly in the 70s then that you were in Brazil. Yeah, mostly in the 1970s. Unfortunately, it ended, and so I wasn't able to go back anymore, but it was a great experience. Who was president back then in the 70s? Of the United States? Or no, of, uh, of Brazil, sorry. Well, it's very interesting because that you asked that because um, I was just thinking about that, how different Brazil is today than it was then. See, Brazil was a military dictatorship back then. It wasn't a democracy like it is now. Outra coisa interessante sobre os sotaques do sudeste dos Estados Unidos é que eles têm a tendência de pôr a ênfase na primeira sílaba de substantivos muito mais do que no resto do país. Ele acabou de falar dictatorship, que eu ia pronunciar dictatorship. Outras diferenças comuns. Insurance, em vez de insurance. United States, em vez de United States. E até TV, em vez de TV. See, Brazil was a military dictatorship back then. It wasn't a democracy like it is now. And you couldn't really tell the difference on the streets so much, you know, that it was military di dictatorship. But when you would read the paper and you would see just, you know, the political climate and all of that, um, you could really see the difference. I don't remember the name of the president at that time, but he would have been the head of the military junta that was running the country rather than an elected president. Now, with um, you know Dilma Rousseff and and uh, Lula and the uh, current president, I don't recall his name right Timmer. now. All those different politicians they're in the paper all the time, so you can keep up with it. When you come in and you've been in the United States and you come to Brazil, tremendous diversity, everything from the carnival in Rio to the food, you know to um, the, the general culture like that. But then another thing that you um, sort of see right off is that the economy is a whole lot different. And of course, inflation in Brazil, after the time I was there, it got worse. But inflation, you could already see because everything, every time I would go down there, um, there would be more cruzeiros that I would get for my dollar. 
and and they had they they revalued the crucero a couple of times i think since then it was crucero and then it was cruzado you know and so you noticed all these economic things like that and then you you notice the uh, tremendous um, racial diversity of the people in brazil compared to the united states and how much more relaxed they are about that than we are in the United States. Do you happen to have that Portuguese book that you showed me that one time? I meant to bring it in. Do you happen to have? É uma maneira educada de perguntar, do you have? De repente, é semelhante a diferença em português entre você tem e será que o senhor tem? Algo assim. E quando ele falou, I meant to do something, é a forma mais comum de falar, eu pretendi fazer alguma coisa. É muito mais comum do que I intended to do something. Nota que o infinitivo se pronuncia to mean, mas no passado torna-se meant. Do you happen to have that Portuguese book that you showed me that one time? I meant to bring it in. I don't think I've got it here. Um, but it, it says Portuguese para estrangeiros. Uh, and I bought it in a, in a Livro Globo. <laughs> I can even remember that in Porto Alegre on the recommendation of my interpreter, Hedy Hoffman, that I told you about before. Uh, I think I took it home when I forgot to bring it in. Muito obrigado por la oportunidade de ter o conversação, or something like that, you know. But my yes. Portuguese, like I say, is pretty rusty. That was awesome. That was great. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you all, and thank you.